Hello everybody and welcome to the Premier League Nightclub Podcast. My name is Damon and with me I have Sam and I have Woody. Boys, how, how are we doing? Because Woody, let's be honest, we've just spent the last like 10 minutes listening to some pretty ordinary stuff out of Sam's mouth. So now we can get stuck into the football. Sam, how, how are you? I'm fine, thank you very much, Damon. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all we're going to get after here. I'm literally listening here for 10 minutes non-stop. Sam Ramble about his single life and he's... F- Honestly, single just escapades. pretty thankful that the mic wasn't recording because mm. really don't want to have to listen to that all over again. Oh but um, God, you guys. calm down, mate. <laughs> you were loving it when you were telling the story. <laughs> he always claims that he's embarrassed, but he he low key loves it. Loves, loves every it. second of it. I'm surprised you're not taking the opportunity to tell everyone as well, mate. <laughs> There's nothing to tell. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, yep. it's been an interesting week in football. We've seen some milestones, and we've seen a few huge things happen as well. But Sammy, your main man, Cristiano Ronaldo, I swear every week I say Sammy's got a new main man, but Ronaldo is one <laughs> of Sammy's... Once every four months. I'm not on that, mate. I'm not on that at all. Yeah, good. <laughs> well, Cristiano Ronaldo made his thousandth, thousandth appearance on the pitch. Absolute legend. And Sammy, you're going to hit us with a few stats. I'll just hit you with a few stats, uncharacteristically of me, but... I pull these ones out for the for the great man, and I'll put it like this: seven hundred twenty five goals, two hundred twenty one assists, thirty one trophies, five Ballon d'Ors, three Premier Leagues, five Champions Leagues, one hundred twenty eight Champions League goals, four Club World Cups, two La Ligas, one Serie A, one Euro, and one Nations League. Jeez, I tell you what, if he keeps going, he could be quite a player. If you try. <laughs> Good, good young prospect. Yeah. I'd, sign, I, I'd sign if Portsmouth on loan if, can, <laughs> if I was on manager mode. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's funny enough, this weekend as well, um, obviously Ronaldo won't enjoy it, but Messi actually passed him for the most goals in Europeans top five, Europe's top five legs. Uh, if, well, actually, last weekend, I think it was, when he scored four goals for Barcelona. So it's just like a reflection of how unbelievable those two it's are. Right. I, I think it's very lucky that we're... At- old enough to appreciate it now, I think, as well. Because yeah. you look at basketball, uh, soccer, football, and golf and things like that, and not these players only come around once in a generation, and I think it's really important to sit back and just appreciate I think the only thing you can com- how good they are. The only thing you could compare it to is probably tennis, how like we've got a bit of a golden generation at yeah. the moment with tennis, Nadal, tennis Djokovic, well, and Federer. Yeah. yeah, it's very mm-hmm. similar in that regard. And obviously everybody's going to have their opinion on who's better, but I'd... Don't really like to get stuck in, into all that at the moment. It's just unbelievable to watch these two go at it. At the ages they are, they're like 34 and 35, 33 and 35, yeah. something like that. So and, it's pretty insane. And Ronaldo probably is going to win Serie A's player of the season at the rate he's going as well. Yeah. And no doubt they'll pro- he's probably going to stick another Serie A title in his bag um, in a trophy room that I'm sure is, is looking like a trophy hotel at the moment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, genuinely. All right. And speaking of Serie A though, Big news out of Italy, and of course, we probably haven't discussed the coronavirus at all on this pod. Well, it's uh, probably accelerated significantly in, in the last week. week. Yeah, 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 for sure. And so, yeah, no Serie A games for, for about a month. I think it's April 3rd off the top of my head. That's when it returns. Well, that's when the scheduled return is, but that could easily be delayed even more. And yeah, just it's, it's pretty scary stuff, isn't it, boys? It is scary stuff, but obviously, I don't know if, if you two know more than me. I don't know a hell of a lot about how serious it is right now, and to see things like this happening. I mean, we're not that affected by it in Australia, but things over in Italy, like they're talking about tourism bans coming up. It's it's not only bad for, for football and things like that, but it's really bad for their economy, tourism, their economy, and it's something that really, like, I just hope gets under control sooner rather than later. Although all signs are pointing to it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, which is not good to see. Well, I mean, even here in Australia, the stock market has taken a bit of a plunge over the last week or so um, with obviously trade bans and stuff. Well, not trade bans, but trade restrictions coming from China and whatnot. However, um, trade bans is not the, the topic of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. um, we're sticking football related. However, and I'm going to deviate again because, Damo, we actually had a huge week at your house. <laughs> speaking of economics. <laughs> speaking of economics and uh, money fluidity, um, we, had a, we had a 16-man poker tournament at your house. We did, and it was it was a good night. Yeah, I thought it went. It, right. it went pretty late, didn't it? 
Yeah, not for me. I, I think I think it was he just shits him. Yeah, <laughs> the the time of when it finished was late, but I think it was just like the whole thing was like five and a half hours, and I really only expected it to go for about four. But mm. you know, live and learn, and I, I'm pretty sure everyone enjoyed it anyway. Mm. It was a lot of fun, and it's I was sitting there on the table because the, we stayed there, and the Bournemouth Liverpool game came on. Yep. While before we before we'd migrated from two tables to a final table. Yep. And so I was lucky enough to be watching... Um, you were in the prime seat. I obviously. was. I was watching Bournemouth score their first goal as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess say Josh King was absolutely running rings around the Liverpool defence in the first 30 minutes. However, it was made, made me think, who would you guys have on your poker table of EPL stars or EPL identities, I guess, if you were to, if you were to put together a table? Who would, who, who would it be past who, who would and you present? Have? Past, past and- present, managers, the works. <sighs> Even commentators. I can only think of one right now. Hit us. All right, go. And that's Zlatan Ibrahimovic. He'd be a character. Main man. And a <laughs> yes, yes that was his man. <laughs> My man. But, mate, you wouldn't want to do anything against him. You wouldn't want to, like, raise him or... Oh, the, he'd the just, looks he'd give you. The looks he'd give you. <laughs> if, if you did something that he didn't like, he'd take you out I back and he, w- he would probably be the only player to get pocket aces every, every single, single hand. hand. Yes. <laughs> and the pocket... He doesn't get pocket aces. The pocket aces get slapped. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. Yeah. Damo, what about you? Uh, I think I'd probably have to go with like an Anthony Martial only because of the whole like how he thing he doesn't smile at all. So he'd have an unbelievable poker face. Like he could mm. get 7 2 off suit or pocket aces and his facial expression would be exactly the same. So yeah. I think I'd go, I'd go with Anthony Martial. I reckon I've got a few. First one, Frank Lampard. Because I reckon he's the type of guy that would be reserved. He'd be super until, like. Until he gets uh, like some ridiculous sort of full house and he will go nuts. Yeah, yeah. He will yeah. go nuts. And the second one. Is inspired by that Peter Crouch podcast. It would be Peter Crouch. He <laughs> would be telling yarns, absolute <laughs> stories and a half on that poker table, and he would make everyone piss themselves. <laughs> sort of reminds me of um, what Kevin Hart does when he plays professionally, and you yeah, see yeah, him on yeah. telly. But I reckon Peter Crouch would be telling some serious furfies. Oh, serious furfies. So funny. And like, he it, it wouldn't even have to say anything at times. He'd just like give looks, and everyone would crack just up. Just hear his laugh, like, ha ha ha. <laughs> 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 everyone would go nuts. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it has been a pretty big week in the Premier League, although the score lines weren't too big, Woody. So, it was bleak. Yeah, Mate, it was a trash. Nine teams failed to register a goal. Only, what a trash week. Only two games all week and had both teams scoring. So lucky we didn't have too much of that in the in the multi. Yeah, well, we didn't have a lot of good things going on in the multi, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> You cost right. me 20 bucks. <laughs> you did not put money on that. No, I did. <laughs> funny, funny enough, I actually had like one or two more people message me and show me like screenshot proof that I they reckon, put it on I as well. three quarters of the people at the poker night had the multi on as <laughs> I was like, oh, I felt really bad. But don't worry, this week we're coming back even stronger and I can guarantee you this time. No, shut up, mate. Put oh, your this, house on this it. This is the second multi in a row that you've only scored one leg correctly out of four. And we'll run through them. Watford win versus Palace, loss. Sheffield win versus Norwich, actual win. Wolves win versus Brighton, loss. And Leicester and Aston Villa draw. Now, I don't know how the hell you picked the last one. But that was, I think Leicester put Villa in a grave. It was, it was 4-0 and then 8-1 across the both games this season. <laughs> but to, to, to be fair, the, what, I'll criticise myself here. I did say that Damon's dollars wasn't going to be all about... You know, bullying the bottom of the table team and racking up easy. That's exactly, easy, that's exactly, exactly what's We're happened. looking for value here. <laughs> <laughs> right. But don't worry, there's more value coming this week. Uh, but for now, it is worth properly announcing. We teased it a few weeks ago, Woody, mm. you and I. <clears throat> uh, something for the Newcastle fans. Yes, it is the DiCaprio of Turnside. It is <laughs> Steve Wraith himself is coming on the show and giving us all of the goss in a week where he has seen plenty of media attention following his um, interview with Floyd Mayweather as well. But that is something we're going to get into a little bit later, isn't it, guys? Yeah, it's going to be a pleasure to have him on. Hopefully he'll get give us all the info on Newcastle and Premier League and everything alike. So yeah. All right, Woody, until then, would you care to hit us with those quick fire results? To hit off the round, Liverpool beat Bournemouth 2-1 after a scary start. Wolves had a nil-all draw with Brighton. Arsenal beat West Ham 1-0. Newcastle beat Southampton 1-0. Sheffield beat Norwich 1-0. Palace beat Watford 1-0. Burnley, Tottenham ended in a one-all draw. Chelsea absolutely downed Everton 4-0. Man United beat Manchester City 2-0 in the Manchester derby. And Leicester, cap off the round, beat struggling villains 4-0. It was probably one of the more... 
Yeah, as you said, boring rounds of of the you know Premier League season. In, however, in saying that, we are only just talking about one game because of it. But in saying that, it is the Manchester derby this week that we're going to get stuck into because it clearly was the biggest match of the round and the round that had you know everybody talking for a variety of reasons. So let's get stuck into the Manchester derby and it was Man United versus Manchester City. We've had six minutes of stoppage time. He's gone quick from halfway. Oh, Nathan! Unbelievable! Scott McTominay brings the house down. And Manchester United in the Manchester rain are going to do the double over City for the first time in a decade. Scott McTominay doing the job and finishing off uh, a City side that was half the team, let's be honest, than what we're used to. Woody, Sam, what did you make of it? Oh, it was a... It was a- as a, if you were a United supporter watching that game, you'd be over the moon. Yeah. But as a City supporter, I think you'd really be missing the presence of KDB in the midfield. Because I think that's where it started, really. And before we get stuck into the game, I think the team sheet is probably almost where City lost the game. Um, but coming into it, I mean, United had to win because they could have slipped all the way to 10th and potentially or 9th or potentially even 10th if they had lost and, and the people surrounding them had won. That's how short um, and how, how tight that race is for a top six. And City, on the other hand, looked like they've cemented their second spot. So not too much to play for, but a Manchester derby always worth showing up for. It's definitely, I mean, outside of where the two teams sit, it's something that both teams always want to win. I remember back in the day when City were not much chop at all and they always came to these Manchester derbies and they always had something to play for so mm. I don't think we can take away the fact that there was nothing to play for because as you just said there is always something to play for with these but yes in the grand scheme of the Premier League at the moment it wasn't that much of a big deal but for United they're getting ed- edging them edging themselves closer and closer to that Chelsea spot in fourth which is great to see yeah I think like we'll get stuck into the ramifications for Manchester Manchester City a little bit later on but I just felt that the post match, a lot was made about City and their realis- realistically poor performance. But I just think we're talking about a team who lifted a trophy seven days before this game and have in an incredibly good position in the Champions League in the round of 16 against Real Madrid. So it's not all doom and gloom for Manchester City, also still in the FA Cup. They've got plenty to play for. This one would obviously hurt. But this one, this one was all about Man United and they just simply had to get the chocolates in this one. Yeah, completely. I think Angie Martial, Anthony Martial was a standout man from the get-go, really. And he started up top in what people maybe would have thought he would have struggled against. However, he really showed like his true colors and, and showed what a lot of Man U fans have been wanting from him the whole time. And that is 90... Or, no, he didn't came off. So the whole time he was on the ground is to put in 100% work rate and run, run, and run. And I think that's something that he delivered for the first time I think in in the last couple of months, really, is, is an effortless display where he just didn't stop running. Yeah, I think lots of talk about Martial needing a goal to start playing. And and it was a little bit like that uh, on the weekend. But even then, he he played his role perfectly. We saw him almost score when Edison uh, you know, fumbled a ball just in front of goal. There were so many opportunities for him. And you felt, even though he did just have the nine passes, he was always in the game. You know, we're talking about a Man United team who no player had more than 40 passes anyway. So they clearly came with a plan. When your striker has a shot almost every time, he, every second time he touches the ball, I don't think you can criticize him like at all. And I think he, he did a job and it was com- uh, you know, complimented heaps by some hard running by Daniel James and, of course, the quality of Bruno Fernandes who found him with that tricky free kick. And I said that Martial would be good on a poker table. Well, that little dummy, or the dummy, the in the build, acting in the build-up to the free kick, acting like he wasn't concentrating. That's pr- <laughs> prime, prime area. Damo, your opinion, was that, a, was that a training ground exercise? Someone's been watching the discussion between Ryan Giggs and Michael Owen at <laughs> halftime. Uh, no, I, I think it's training ground. I reckon it's training yeah. ground. I think there's no way that they didn't just decide to... They didn't, there's no way they just decided to do that uh, on match day. That's clearly something those two have been working together. And that bromance that's you know coming about between those two, you mm. saw them on the bench after the game pretty much hugging. You don't really see that emotion from Martial or Fernandez from a, you know, other than when he's playing too much off field, Fernandez doesn't get in, involved in too much. So, you know, those two are working well together. And I, I actually think that is a, a partnership that would be deadly if they could carry on that sort of bromance as well, because Martial and Bruno Fernandez, if they click, and and Bruno, if Bruno Fernandez is essentially the one that has the key to unlocking Martial's full potential, mm-hmm. then that is going to prove 
much more than the worth of what Fernandez is worth money wise. Exactly. And he's lifted that whole squad, but one person that was doing absolute bits before Fernandez came in has continued big time is Aaron Wambasaka. And I just thought, you know, we spoke about pretty much have the exact same conversation last Manchester Derby. Raheem Sterling is going to be having nightmares. <laughs> About yeah, Wan-Bissaka. It's, he just can't get past him. And that's 20 games now for Raheem Sterling without a goal against Man United. <sighs> Clearly has an issue playing against them. And when saying that, he was a Man United fan growing up, so maybe there's something in there. He just, doesn't want to score against his doesn't want to score against his boiled team. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Actually, that's Bissaka a question. I had to, had to deviate from the game. If you were a Raheem Sterling type of player, would you be annoyed if you scored against your boyhood boyhood team, especially if it had ramifications for them? No, not at all. I reckon. Yeah. I think when you get into the league, all that goes away. Yeah, you hear that from like almost every yeah. professional sportsman that in, you know, whether it's a draft or just yeah. gets because picked I feel, up. I feel like it becomes when you get into the league, or when you, get, for instance, I don't know, relating it to anything, any sort of sport. When you get into that, it it. It's not like it's a fairy tale anymore because you get to know the opponent's players. You start to form a, a like or dislike to the individuals at the club rather than the club itself that you used to mm. idolise. Yeah, I think you so put I a voice like, and a face to the people around you, and that's yeah. that suddenly becomes more important than yeah than what the one what the colours that they're wearing when yeah. you're versing them. Obviously, the colours you're wearing mean everything to you. But what everyone else is wearing, they're just an opponent. And I think that's what happens when people enter. I, I don't know. It just automatically puts me back towards like the Ollie McBurney where he was in the um, stands versus Swansea. Mm-hmm. And now I just look at a lot of these players now. If they were to get the tie against a boyhood club, would they take the risk and say, hey, look, I've got a niggle. Sit me out of this game. Or would they rather score and, or, or in, and take their current club rather than punish their boyhood club? I think they'd take their current club any day of the week. Yeah, well, it actually, I mean, we're going way, way off topic Way, off topic. But, way but, off topic. but can I just bring up one more thing? I don't know if you guys noticed that Harry Wilson, who was on loan um, from Liverpool, well, he's at Liverpool, on loan at Bournemouth, obviously wasn't allowed to play against Liverpool on the weekend, mm. but he was seen in the stands wearing a Liverpool jacket. And a lot of people had issue with it. And I can understand, if you were a Bournemouth fan, I don't know if you'd be too happy with about that. I mean, Absolutely you're, you're, not. Cu- you're currently under contract with Bournemouth. I don't care what circumstances you know were surrounding that, whether he, was, he said on Twitter that he was really just really cold and it was an easy option. There was a Liverpool jacket there that someone offered him from the club. And it's, it's you know, still- I just feel like that's no excuse. You've got to use your, your head there. And, you know, it doesn't matter what your plans are for the off-season, regardless of whether Bournemouth stay up or not. But I think those fans are probably stressing enough as it is on whether they're going to stay up or not. The last thing they need is one of their star players wearing, wearing the opposition's, opposition's kit. Yeah. Right, anyway, let's, let's, back, bring, let's, let's bring it back to the so, game. So now for Manchester City, they've cemented that top two spot. What do they do in the next ten games? Like, how do they take it? Do they do they explore a bit more? What do they? I think, how do you see it going for them? I think it's it's a really tough position to be in. I think about actually Man United probably being in one a similar case a couple of seasons ago when they finished second and City got to a hundred points. They really had nothing to play for for the last few months of the season other than uh, Europe and FA Cup. So. I just think City are in a very similar situation. It's going to obviously be hard to stay motivated at times, but as we said, a Manchester derby you shouldn't need any more motivation than there already is. Uh, I yeah, it's it's a tough one for City. I, I just think that Pep might use it to experiment. We saw obviously Phil Foden make a rare start mm. for City in the league, and, and he had a trash game. Didn't yeah, he? He, trash I, game. Not completely his fault though, Woody. No, no, and I said it in the intro to this game, and I'll say it again now. I think. The game was won for uh, sorry. The game was lost for City on the team sheet alone because you saw Phil Foden start on the right wing, and for me, that's definitely not his best position. I know um, it was De Jong after the game in the in the post match presser. He was on oh, sorry in a in a sideline interview. He was saying that Foden has never played extremely well on a wing. He always plays better in a midfield three or through the midfield line. And that's because he has the vision to, to, to set up a game and push forward as well. On the wing, he got isolated, especially against um, you know the likes of Luke Shaw and, uh, Brandon, and Brandon Williams as well. They both had his number. It was essentially 2v1 for most of the game. So for me, if Phil Foden started there and Bernardo Silva started on the right wing, it would have been a different story. But then also, it leads me to the question as well, would you rather, in Pep's, in Pep's um, I, I guess, in, in Pep's situation... Would you rather sacrifice Phil Foden's game to benefit Bernardo Silva, or would you rather switch him around and play him in their correct position, knowing that whoever's playing right wing is getting double teamed? 
I, I don't... I, it's a really good question, but I think it's almost impossible to answer. I think that the bigger question is, why didn't Pep change anything for 75... For, for an hour, I mean, much. post-match, he said they played really well. Yeah, it was it was a bizarre uh, look on the game from Pep. I look at... I look at what happened when Mares came on. Brandon Williams suddenly had to play a lot more defensive because if you look at the heat map comparing Juan Bissaka and Brandon Williams, Williams was almost playing as a left winger at times and Juan Bissaka was flat out right back. So they really were playing completely different roles on either sides of the pitch. But, you know, Foden just couldn't exploit the space in behind Williams. And then as soon as Mares came on, who, keeping him on, isn't the quickest player in the world. He's quick, but he's not Raheem Sterling. And he left Williams for dead. Multiple times. And so I just thought, why not give Sterling a go on the right? And, you know, some sources at Man City say that Pep hates having players... Uh, that, that's why he's always been critical of Leroy Sane. He hates having left wingers only being left-footed and right-footers only being right-footed. And he wanted Foden coming in on his left. But nevertheless, I just thought it was it was really strange that Pep being the great manager that he is, didn't make a, a quicker change or at least a change out from the players that were out there rather than even bringing on a substitute. Something else to come out of this game, actually, that I found quite interesting was that Manchester United have actually completed the league double over Chelsea and City for the first time since the 1960-61 season. Oh. Does that just, like, that seems, it's almost a stat that seems wrong because it's so long ago. Yeah, I think it's it's almost a reflection of this team. Is this the best Man United team even in the last five years? Probably not. Is it the most likable? Potentially. I just think that the the work that this team's putting in, we're finally seeing, you know, s- some reward for these yeah. perform hard working performances. W- what are your take? I think Ollie's vision is really coming into um, really coming into fruition. account and fruition as well. But I think the double only comes because this is maybe one of the worst top six seasons that we've seen. In the last twenty yeah, years, that is true, and yes. and I don't think that double would, that that double double would have been done had it have been five six years ago. Well, no way. Yeah. Well, I mean, ironically, just on that, off the back of this loss for Manchester City, this is actually their seventh defeat of the year, making it Pep's worst season in the Premier League to date. So back- I'm pretty sure it's the most amount of losses he's actually had with a team ever, ever. Oh, well, being we'll seven, and his last go. one was Bayern with six. Mm-hmm. And that was tied with City of, of, of 2015. Which, 15, just, 16, yeah. which, I think, yeah. which, as you were just saying, speaks volumes about what the Premier League is like for the top six teams at the moment. And they are beatable, except for Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I think it's, it's one of those ones where you know, we'll almost know what this game meant at the end of the season mm-hmm. rather than right for now. Sure. And right now, obviously, those two teams that played in it are going to be feeling the emotions of it. But I think the bigger you know, repercussions of it will know at come season's end. Well, it's interesting you say that because come season's end, there might be another predicament. And I want to throw one at you boys because I had a few conversations during the week and this generally came up and it stumped me. And it's not quite Sam the Simpleton or Woody the Simpleton. It's a little bit of an upgrade from Sam the Simpleton here. And sorry, Sammy, to take your limelight. But Sam the Simpleton doesn't happen for ages. Uh, maybe he's just not so simple anymore. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that's I've a credit up. to you. Bummer, because <laughs> the graphics ready to go as well. Is it actually? Yeah, it is. Wow, we should do one. <laughs> anyway, let me throw you fellas a little bit, of pre- little bit of a predicament here. City go on to win the FA Cup. And that means they qualify for the Europa League. Obviously, with the ban in place, if City were to win, who's taking their place in the Europa League? Well, I think what happened last year, because Man City finished first and obviously qualified for Champions League and won the FA Cup, then their Europa League spot went to Wolves, who had to go through qualifying rounds. So off the top of my head, without trying to confuse myself, would that then mean that eighth place gets the... Qualify, it gets an attempt to qualify for the Europa League through playoffs? Well, if that's the case, that means whoever's finishing eighth is making it to Europe. Yes. Because obviously City's out. And currently, currently, Tottenham and, Arsenal. Tottenham and Arsenal are battling that out with Arsenal only being, what, two points off Tottenham. That means the Blades are guaranteed Europa League in seventh. Currently, as it sits. That's so it'd be the Blades, Wolves, mate. Sheffield, Tottenham. That's nuts. <laughs> That's great. I actually like. I know there's it's still like eight teams left in the FA Cup, so we're not calling it yet. But Man City are probably the favourites, given Liverpool are out of the FA Cup. So yeah, I mean that that could be one of the stories of the season if if um, 
the FA don't overturn, or UEFA, I should say, don't overturn the Man City decision and Man City go on to win the FA Cup. Be yeah, massive. Mate, it'd be mental. And that makes me, imagine, imagine seven, seven teams without City being in Europe. Man, the likes of the Wolves... <laughs> Sheffield, Sheffield, mate, and Burnley what, are two points off Tottenham as well. That's what <laughs> dreams are made out of, mate. Yeah, you get up for the cup, and I reckon the, the cup's going to give us some seriously good uh, fixtures get next some, season. Some good get-ups. Too good. Alrighty, lads, let's move on, because we've spoken about this game for a bloody Way while. Yeah, Let's get stuck into winners and losers. Oi, did someone say winners and losers? Sure did, mate. All right, I'm going to kick it off with my winner, and my winner of the week is the veteran, the 34-year-old James Milner, and I thought his game on the weekend for Liverpool summed up why he came to the club. Started just the sixth game this season for Liverpool, his sixth game for the season, I should say, and it's just, he's played 760-odd minutes, but what he did on the weekend, I thought, just was... A credit to him, and Liverpool fans will always forget or always remember his goal line clearance. And it was just one of those ones where comes on or starts, I should say, eighty four passes at eighty seven percent, won seven of nine duels, won all his aerial duels. If he wasn't playing, it could have been a lot different because obviously Bournemouth went up one nil. It was the first time all season Liverpool looked a little bit out of sorts, and I thought his experience, his title winning experience pulled that team together and got them over the line. So, yeah, he's my winner and obviously so are Liverpool. Woodra, who is your winner? Well, Damo, you've gone for a 34-year-old. I'm going for the 19-year-old Billy Gilmore. Uh, put in an amazing shift against Everton on the weekend to back up his performance against Liverpool the week before, even though he made his debut back in August, being a British youngster, of course, has just been picked up the, by the media late on. Anyway, the 19-year-old just hit the headlines <laughs> And um, he was playing a little bit deeper against Liverpool. However, pushed forward in the second half um, against Everton. And boy, oh boy, he looked unreal. Um, Roy Keane actually said that, you know, he is always looking for the ball, busy, got his head up, um, makes quick passes, always passing the ball forward as well. And his decision-making is unlike many 19-year-olds that come across on the park. So hopefully he's got a bright future. And for me, I reckon he shouldn't be overloaded with tactics and just let him play the way he plays. Sammy, who is your loser, winner of the week? My winner of the week is Sheffield, simply because they got the win and they now have a game in hand, which if they beat Villa, which I think we are all tipping they do, <laughs> <laughs> um, they'll, they'll cement pretty much that. They'll go straight into that fifth spot. And like you were saying before, if the Europa League is going to go down to eight, then They're almost well, <laughs> well done to Sheffield. What a fantastic return to the league. And also giving Damon some credibility in his stupid multi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Damo, who is your loser of the week? My loser is a team Sammy just mentioned, Aston Villa. Look, a terrible performance against an out-of-form Leicester. A 4-0 loss absolutely kills their goal difference, which up until this game was pretty similar to the teams around them. Now at negative 22 and sitting 19th on the table, they're in big trouble. Out of their 10 remaining games for Villa, seven include Chelsea, Sheffield, Wolves, Liverpool, Man United, Everton, and Arsenal, they are going down. And without too much of a fight, I assume. Woody, who is your loser? All right, my loser of the week is Watford. Obviously, they had the loss on the weekend. However, now they only sit uh, goal difference above relegation. And with Manchester United, Leicester in the next four, along with Burnley and Southampton, they are looking... Mighty scary for relegation in what we predicted was hopefully going to be a huge season for them. Now, I don't know if we can defend them for that much longer. And if they keep slipping up uh, slipping up like they did on the weekend, boy, oh boy, they're going to be facing the second division next season. Sammy, who is your loser of the week? My loser of the week is Tottenham, simply because they a one will a one a one all draw with Burnley leaves them seven points away from Chelsea in fourth. As well as Bergwijn also being reportedly a chance to miss the rest of the season due to an ankle, inju- ankle injury. Sorry, I can't talk today. But yes, they are not. Ha- they've had a season from hell. But as we just said, but before again, and we'll mention it again, there's still a chance of Europe, which is just berserk. I tell you what, no Kane, no Son, no Bergwijn. I reckon Mourinho thrives in these sort of games. Yeah, he's going to love the challenge, especially with the expectation now off him. It might release the pressure a little bit. And, you know, we saw what he could do with no pressure on him back in Porto and, you know, in in Milan and stuff like that. So who knows what Jose can pull out of his hat. All right. 
The moment has come, boys. All righty. For our, for our interview. For our, for our special guest. First one in a while, to be honest. Yeah, the DiCaprio of Turnside. <laughs> Steve Wraith. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it when he gets on because... We've been hanging out for this, and I reckon Newcastle fans are going to enjoy this. It would, it'll be good. So, we, should we get him on the line? Let's do it. Steve Ray, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you. I'll just firstly open up with, how are you fresh off your big interview yesterday? Went very well. Great to be on the show, lads. Nice to talk to people on the other side of the world. And um, from my perspective, yeah, it went, it went really well. I mean, you know, I do that for a living in Newcastle, do events, you know, usually with former Newcastle legends, but... I do dabble in boxing and professional boxing, so it's nice to have the big names over. And Floyd came two years ago, and uh, you know he did he did put something in the newspaper, the Daily Star, and in England reported that he was interested in getting involved in buying a football club. And why not buy Newcastle? Because he enjoyed he enjoyed the social life, he enjoyed the night out. So, from our perspective, you know, and from my perspective, it was a golden opportunity when I, with his interviewing him this time around that I was going to ask him a question. So, my opening gambit was, you know. Are you still interested in buying Newcastle United? Which, of course, you know, he said yes. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's very tongue in cheek. But I mean, I did it really for for two reasons: a, because you know you want to ask that question, but b, I knew it would go viral, and I knew that the the major news at, at, you know outlets would would pick it up and run with it as if it was something serious. And I think what it highlights, and the reason I did it was, it highlights how you know how easy it is to start the rumor off, which is what. You know, Keith Bishop and, and Mike Ashley have been doing for the last few years very successfully in and around transfer deadline days in the summer and in the winter. <clears throat> well, we know you're, you, you, so, you sort of work with boxing as well, but we know you're a, a bit of a Leonardo DiCaprio of Turnside as well. Um, you have a huge acting background, and that I guess that's your position now, and that's your main mainstay as a job is an actor. So sort of how did you get into acting as well, but then how did you sort of get into boxing and football as well? Acting is a passion, um, and I, I always wanted to be an actor when I was at school. So my very first acting job was when I was seven years of age. Uh, you know, basically, I, I did a, a school play, played the lead role, and um, I fell in love with it then. And the abridged version, really, is I, you know, I, I trained as an actor on a Saturday morning at a youth club, uh, drama school, from eleven until I was eighteen. All eyes were set on becoming a professional actor, but then I ended up doing a, a touring play, a pantomime, as we call it, the Christmas play. Um, in in England, and I basically got ripped off by the by the organisation that I was working with. So I, I basically decided not to be an actor anymore. And uh, for the next twelve years, I uh, I worked in the post office industry, um, in the family business. I worked in a, a newspaper shop, which is a family business. And then I went into security. I basically started working in security on the doors of Newcastle. I worked on the pubs and the nightclubs, etc., for eighteen years. Um, and it was really just to a good friend who had done very well in acting who suggested that I, I potentially get back into uh, the acting game. He said I would regret it, you know, in years to come if I didn't at least give it another go. So that's what I did when I turned 30. Went into being a, a supporting artist, an extra, so like a background artist, you know, the kind of person you see like sitting in the coffee shop and yeah. uh, neighbours um, or, <laughs> you know, going down the surf club and home and away. You know, <laughs> you know, these people who don't have any words, um, and that, that was me. That's what I did. So I did that for six years, and then I went back to get educated. I went back and did a, a qualification in drama. I did a, a, an English degree in drama and performing arts for about three years. And I graduated when I turned 40, and I became a professional at 40. So for the last eight years, I've been very lucky, um, because you have to be lucky as an actor. It's all, it's all very well being able to learn the language and to do it. But from my perspective, I've uh, you know, managed to get some really good parts. I specialise in playing bad guys. Um, I can do other roles, but just the certain looks that I have and, you know, the, the builds that I am. And, you know, I'm a big lad. Um, you know, from my perspective, it's, you know, it's the roles that I get. But, yeah, it's my passion. Is it my main job? Is it something that pays the bills on a regular basis? It's not because I'm not working every week at the minute on that. So my main my main income really is, is events. You know, I do events, you know, big, big events, whether it's with Paul Gascoigne, whether it's with Alan Shearer, whether it's with Peter Beardsley, yeah. all great names from the past, um, or whether it's with you know the fighters like Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson, a band of Hollywood people. I work with it with a lot of the big names. So yeah, this, the events was very simple. I got into the events through managing a Sunday football team of all things. I, I was a, I was an amateur <laughs> football manager for twenty for twenty years, um, and I had to raise money to get uh, to pay our pitch fees, to pay for the um, to pay for the strips and, and that kind of thing. So 
1995, I did an event in you know in our local pub. I put a big dance act on and I put um, uh, Malcolm McDonald on, former Newcastle United number nine. Uh, the overheads for the event were three hundred pounds, and um, I've got to be honest, I was really worried, thinking I would never cover it. Yeah. But I priced the ticket to five pound a ticket. Um, you know, I did one hundred and fifty tickets, and we managed to pay the the acts, and you know, we covered the money for the strips and for the pitch fees, and <laughs> that was it. That was the very first event, and I never intended on becoming an event manager, but it's just I've always let life go, you know, take me where it wants us to take. Because I'm I'm a great believer that our lives are all mapped out, you know, and it still takes hard work and effort. And um, your life is mapped out, and if you put the work and effort in, you'll get where you want to be. Yeah, of course. And I, uh, you know, uh, do, just doing a bit of research into you coming onto the show, we know um, that you're, you know, you have a lot of support for the Dorman of Newcastle as well. And you mentioned that you've been a Dorman for eighteen years. Um, just a quick question yeah. before we get stuck into the Newcastle team as well: Have you ever seen any of the players rock up to a venue a little bit, a little bit um, out of their mind, or <laughs> a, bit, a bit, bit out of sorts? And oh, you've said, "Hey, yeah. boys, pull your head in. You got a game on the weekend," yeah. or I mean, probably going back as far as the 1980s, before I became a doorman, um, I remember going out. I remember going out with the lads one Friday night in Newcastle City Centre, and um, you know we we always and this is the old license now. Like, the bar finished at eleven, then you would go nightclubbing from eleven till two, and then you go for a curry. That was like your tradition. <laughs> you know, Friday, Friday night out. Friday night out with the lads. So then we ended up um, bumping into Mickey Quinn, who was Newcastle's number nine, at the <laughs> um, and Mickey. Mickey Quinn was coming out of the Indians at 12 o'clock. <laughs> for the wind. Um, and we just went, Mickey, you've got a game tomorrow. He went, I know, I know. He says, I'll probably not play so well because I'm going there. <laughs> you know, but you know what he got? He got on the pitch the next day and he scored two goals against Port Vale. So, you know, from, from our perspective, that's like the, the good old days, as opposed to the footballer's point of view. And it's so funny to, to think back to those memories. But when I worked on the door, I think the funniest one, and it doesn't really... It doesn't really, um, it doesn't really look at the Newcastle player being a bit naughty. It was, um, I used to work on the doors at Tiger Tiger in Newcastle with the head dorm in there. And uh, Monday night was a big student night. All the football players from Newcastle and Sunderland would come in Newcastle City Centre to come to this night. Um, and this particular night, the Newcastle players had just arrived. And it was some of the younger players, one of which was Sammy Amiogi, who oh, yeah. came down with Shola Amiogi. And um, we all know that, you know, they probably weren't the greatest of players for Newcastle United, and, you know. Shula did well in the Derbys, but Sammy didn't really make it at Newcastle. Um, and they came to the queue just at the same time. Darren Bent turned up with Lee Catamore. <laughs> and Darren, Darren Bent and Lee, Lee Catamore got there first. And as they walked to the queue, I went, Can you just, just hold it there, lads? And as, as I stopped them, the two of my Yogi brothers came straight forward and I went, Come in, lads, come in. And uh, you, could, you just had to see the face on Lee Catamore and Darren Bent's face. And I went, what, what did you do that for? And I went, well, I've got to let the footballers in first, lads. And that was it. <laughs> 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 oh, that's too good. You've got to have a bit of humour on the door. But yeah, look, there's been situations, there's been incidents where some of them have misbehaved. And, you know, but, um, you know I, I, would, I, wouldn't do, I wouldn't do them the discredit of naming them because, you know, we've all done daft things on nights out and we don't end up getting it publicised. So, you know, those stories are probably best left in my memory. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, just drifting to more like your Newcastle, you know, love for the club and all that sort of stuff. Do you, you've obviously got a little bit more of a voice than your average football fan, that's for sure. Do you feel like your your voice or even anyone's voice as fans is heard enough by the club and by the league, or do you think you know fans should have more of a say or even less of a say? I think fans should have more of a say, and I think individuals should not be, you know, in, individuals should not be put in a position where they're the, like the figurehead, etc. Because nobody can, nobody can be seen as a figurehead for fans. I'm, you know, I'm influential on social media. Social media is obviously still a relatively new, you know, platform. You know, maybe 10, 11 years old now. The likes of Twitter and Facebook, but ultimately, from my perspective, it's given me, given me an opportunity to put my voice out there and. Yeah, it's it put me in some predicaments. I mean, you know, the club attacked me on their own Twitter once, you know, under the under the um, leadership of Ashley with Lambert Eyes by side. The club actually tweeted saying that I was being negative, you know, which got back page headlines over here. And mm-hmm. I've had my fair few run-ins with the club. Um, my relationship with the club at the moment isn't very good, I would say. And, you know, I, I was a big fan and, and, and obviously helped Rafa, you know, considerably in his three-year reign here. And I think that's got up the club's nose a little bit. But, 
yeah, I think it's important to, for fans to have a voice. Um, it's why I supported the Newcastle United supporters just for a short while last year. I'm still a member. I pay me things. But from my perspective, I jumped on board and helped them for six months last year as part of the committee. Um, because I think that it's important that we at least have a fans' representation, a group which people can put their trust in. Uh, you know, excuse the pun, but it, it, it's something which the club, it's a group which the club has to communicate with by, by Premier League law. Newcastle United have to communicate with the trust and have meetings with them at least three times a year. So to put your volume of you know supporters behind the trust would make sense. And you know, in unity is strength, and having you know having fans together makes makes sense. But I think we've got a massive issue now at the football club, and and that big issue is probably well, it is down to Mike Ashley. And I'm not saying that you know forget about his ownership, forget about the way that he runs the club, forget about him as a person. What he's done now in his 13 year tenure is He's caused a divide, and like all good dictators, you divide and conquer. And you know, by splitting fans into different fan bases and groups, then we're never going to be able to overcome, you know, the regime. And mm. that's what he's done. He's split fans up. Yeah. That's partly to do with social media. You know, you'll have seen it yourself, lads. You know, you get somebody who can name a group, um, something to do with NUFC or Magpies or whatever, with Ashley out in it, and. You know, they get 2,000, 3,000 people who follow them straight away on Twitter. Yeah. And those people suddenly have an account which they feel is, is going to change the world. Now, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing because, you know, I'm all for people standing up for their rights and trying to and standing up for the football club and trying to do something proactive. But simply, all it does is, you know, it causes an issue. Some people might want to charge money for something, so you get fans attacking them for that. Some fans might want to... Um, you know, might want you to go and stand outside a shop and shout on a megaphone. You know, but other fans will attack you for that. Some fans will want to do, you know, a trip to London and stand outside Mike Ashley's house. Um, you know, fans will attack them for that. So, you know, nobody can agree at all with, you know, everybody else's view. So that's what I mean by divide and conquer. Some of these groups, and you might, you know, you might laugh at this at first, but you give it a bit of thought. Some of these groups are actually set up, you know, I would say by PR companies who are working for clubs. You know, not necessarily just Newcastle, but, you know, what is a better way of causing dissent amongst fans? Mm. Setting up a social media account and pretending to be a set of fans doing something else, you know? I think we've seen this with a lot of the positive stuff written about about Ashley, for instance, you know? And, you know, you've got parody accounts, which, which crowd the issue because not everybody realises what a parody account is. Mm-hmm. So then somebody, somebody sees something like that the Mike Ashley parody account says, for instance, and they think it's Mike Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> it's Mike Ashley. That would be the biggest one. But that's what happens. And it's, um, you know, it is very much like herding cats, which is a phrase that, which is a phrase that Neil Mitchell, who used to be on the supporters club, the guy, the Geordie from Dubai, yep. he, he coined that phrase years ago. And, and it is, it is like herding cats. It's so difficult to, uh, to, to give, to, to give leadership, you know? So we're stuck really because now Mike Ashley has, what Mike Ashley has done is, is very clever. Um, we've now got a fan base. I'm not sure how old you guys are, but in Newcastle, for instance, I'm 48. Um, but the, you know, a big crowd of let's just say, for instance, a Newcastle United fan who was 20. Um, you know, so what what has he known in his supporting years of, as, a, as a fan of Newcastle? I started to support Newcastle when I was seven and eight. So he's known this guy is only known Mike Ashley. He's only known Mike Ashley running our club. He's only known media. He's only known a, a team that's either struggling to steal or that gets relegated and comes back as a promoted team. So their mindset now is only is only, you know, supporting a team like that. They don't care about Tino Asquia, Alan Shearer, Peter Bealdley, Philip Albert, the entertainers. That that that's history. It means nothing to them. So well, we've got a bit of a set two between and a, and a bit of a you know a bit of a divide between the older supporters and the younger supporters. And what we've seen this season is the older supporters have decided to vote with their feet walk away and 10,000 people didn't renew at the start of the season making Newcastle give away 10,000 tickets taken from January um, not a great business model moving forward and I just think it's going to get worse if you want me on it to do you, do you think if well you've spoken about on other uh, media channels about how you there's been probably a mul- uh, two or three times where Mike Ashley has said that he has interest in selling and then of course it hasn't come about and you you've been strong on the fact that if it were to happen, you feel like it would be a, a sudden change, like it wouldn't be a long process, it would almost wake up at, in the morning and, and it's almost done. If there was to be yeah. a shift, is the shift 
regardless of who comes in, is the mentality the more important thing? Like, do you think Newcastle should be up there with, you know, Liverpool, Man United, or do you are you looking for something else? It wouldn't take a massive amount of investment or difference to change the fortunes of Newcastle United. The Premier League is in decline for me. I don't think the Premier League is as strong. Look at the table this year. You know, usually there's a team cut adrift. Um, you know, we've gone into like March where even Norwich still had an outside chance of staying up. So, you know, the, the Premier League for me is weaker. Um, and I think with Newcastle United, had they, you know, you know, had Mike Ashley swallowed his pride and bowed, bowed to Rafa and what Rafa wanted to do with his project, which he called up when he first came to the club, I think Newcastle would have been, you know, easily in contention for a European slot this year. Um, and, and probably would have gone further in the cups under under Rafa, um, but that you know that Mexican standoff between manager and owner was never going to work. You know the fact that Rafa, you know Rafa had the fans on board as well. You know it was always going to end in tears for for Mike Ashley. And um, you know ultimately, had he given Rafa Benitez the money that he spent in the transfer window in the summer, then you know imagine the kind of players we would have got in. And you know for me, yeah, I do feel that the takeover will be sudden. I think we will wake up one morning and actually we'll be gone. Do I think it will be any time soon? I'd love to think so. I'd love to think that the, the, you know, that there's still something going on in the background with the Saudis, and you know, despite the news that came out of Saudi the other day about one of the, you know, the main principal being, you know, put under house arrest. From my perspective, I, I would like to think that it, 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 it is still ongoing. You know, I do have faith in Amanda Staley. You've got to remember, I met her had dealings with Amanda in the build-up of the first attempt at takeover. She's a broker. She's not looking to put her own money in. She's a broker of the deal. Um, but, you know, uh, just unfortunately, you know, she fell into the trap of the whole Mike Ashley PR, you know, the PR situation. And you've got to, you've got to look at it this way, you know. The only person that's stopping a Catholic United being sold is Mike Ashley. Um, we've had numerous attempts by numerous people. We've had some fake takeovers which have been generated by the publicity machine. But ultimately, you know, I don't really think that Ashley's a willing seller, not just yet. So, do I expect that to happen anytime soon? No, but hey, we could wake up in two weeks' time and it could all be done. <laughs> yeah, well, just looking specifically on field now, I mean, given the pre season and Rafa Benitez leaving in what was obviously the season wasn't looking too good for Newcastle coming in, is Although relegation is not a real threat right now, is this season merely just about staying up? And would you see that as a success? You've got to see it as a success. Steve Bruce specialises in taking teams down. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's harsh. Yeah. The, 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 FA, the FA, what he does, yeah, he specialises in taking teams down, but then getting them promoted. Um, <laughs> but he does have a little bit of a look in the cup. You know, he got Wigan to a cup final, didn't he? So look, you know, he's, it, it, it's a harsh one because anyone who came in after Rafa Benitez was always going to be under extreme scrutiny. Very similar to Ken Dalglish coming in after Kevin Keegan, you know. After yeah. after all those years of you know relative excitement and you know ultimately no success, but relatively exciting player, the best player we've seen since the nineteen fifties. Um, you know, Dalglish coming in looked dour and miserable, and you know the football looked poor. So you know it's always going to be the same under under Bruce. What I'll say about Steve Bruce is, you know, he's, you know he's made of he is made of tough stuff. Um, he can take the criticism. Um, unless it's from Craig Hope by you know by, by his reaction the other week. Um but you can see criticism from people and, and ultimately, you know, he's got the team he's got the, he's obviously got the players on the side. Uh, and and this, this cup run is, is special in the sense that we've now got Man City at home, which everyone thinks is, you know, a, a really tough game. But in essence, Man City don't travel well to Newcastle and they're not playing well at the moment. Um, you know, there's an outside chance Newcastle could be in a, in a semi-final next month, and, and that's fantastic, really. So, look, you've got to give him praise. Um, I deliberately haven't given him stick. The person I've given stick the most to this season is Joe Linton, because I think he's an absolute waste of money. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, Steve, Steve Bruce, you know, you, you take your hat off to him, yeah. Staying up would be a success, and, you know, fair play to him. be interesting to see what happens if, if Mike Ashley is still the owner, you know, how much he, how much he backs him in the transfer window in the summer. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Obviously, Joe Linton hasn't been too good for Newcastle this season. But we also saw, I look at someone like Almiron, who you'd have to say statistically wasn't giving a huge return until recently. Do you, do you feel like you need any, because like, your defense, to be honest, is probably not too bad and one of the better defenses in the league uh, compared to teams around you, but it does seem to be your ability to score goals. I think the whole of February, Newcastle didn't score a goal in the league. 
Does uh, do players like yeah. Joe Linton have the capability to lift next season, or is the transfer market where Newcastle need to head? I think the club. I think the club has to take an extreme amount of responsibility. Uh, Lee Charney and Steve Nixon, the, re- the recruitment guy, need to take responsibility for moving forward. They need to learn from the mistake of Joe Linton. They brought a young Brazilian guy into a, into, into the league. Um, why they paid that money for him, we'll never know. But £40 million pounds is a ridiculous amount of money for what he, <laughs> what he actually does. Yeah. Um, but they gave him the number nine shirt. The number nine shirt is sacrilege on Tyneside. It's, you know, it's got you know, great names like Milburn and McDonald and Gallagher and you know, Andy Cole and Alan Shearer. You know, these names, like the roll off the tongue. We've had a few good ones through the years and sadly Joe Linton joined that list. Um, and, and from my perspective... You know, it, it was the fact that they wouldn't drop him. It just seemed it just seemed as if he had to play. You know, but I agree with you. You look, Almiron statistically wasn't given it. You know, wasn't given it until recently. But his work rate was great. I think the bottom line was it was a massive hangover, which was always going to take time to cure, which was the Rafa Benitez hangover, which of course included the likes of Rondon and Perez, who again Perez took time to settle in. But there was always something about Perez. You always felt Perez was going to come good. And when you look at his goals, he was averaging between you know seven and ten goals a season, you know, which not a fantastic return, but it's a hell of a lot more than Joe Linton was getting. Rondon was a good player, you know, he, he took time again to settle in, Only, and he didn't take time to settle in because of he'd not played in the leagues before. He took time to settle in because he, he'd come back from an injury and a layoff, and he had to get his fitness up. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we took two two top goal scorers away from that season, and you put you put Joe Linton in, who never played in the Premier League. You put St. Maximum in, who never played in the Premier League, and you put Almiron in, who was legitimately now your senior player because he's played some time in the Premier League. Are you expecting it to work? Well, it was just ludicrous. It was crazy. Um, and that's for me, that's for me, you know, that's down to Lee John Lee uh, and Steve Nixon for the recruitment. So they've, 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 they, hope they hung Joel Linton out to dry. You know, I think if he'd been given another shirt, had he been given number 23 or whatever, you know, it, it wouldn't have been as much pressure. But the fact he's number nine. Everyone's looking at him to score goals. That's what that sends out. That's what that message sends out. You know what I mean? So, crazy really. You know, that shirt should be earned. It shouldn't be given. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's something that we actually talked about a lot heading into this season and looking at the ownership, um, I guess, saga with Newcastle as well. And we saw how you guys were, you know, failed to sort of spend money until the last week of the transfer window. And then Joe Linton came in for £40 million. And we sort of look at the list that Newcastle has, and we've said consistently throughout the whole season how good your defence is. But then we've also lauded at times as well, I think especially earlier on the season when I think you guys beat Manchester United, the, the Longstaff brothers as well. And something that I really wanted to ask you heading into this phone call as well is why sort of do you have, like not an agenda, but... You don't, you don't, you don't favour John Joe Shelby very much, and I think there have been times and a few stretches of games that we've actually seen him play really well. And obviously, every player, yep. you know, has their moments. But I was just wondering, you know, is Shelby just not the answer for Newcastle, or is he just not a Newcastle fabric of player? You've got to remember that I worked with Rafa Benitez for three years. I was yeah. part of his inner sanctum, worked, worked within the club, and I knew a lot more about John Joe Shelby than most fans do. Um, ask yourself why. A man who won the Champions League had John Joe Shelby not not on the bench, but just not in the squad. Um, you know, I think that says a lot. I yeah. think from my perspective, you know, he, he, he is, he's an old player. Um, you know, they've given him a new contract, which I find bizarre. Um, but you know, we don't we don't like every player. You know what I mean? We can't like every single player. Yeah, of course. Um, as, as a fan, uh, but, for, but for me, I just don't think he's the answer. Um, Matt Ritchie, on the other hand, he's got he's got the legs, he's got the energy. Um, for me, he could be the captain of the team, and I just think you know Matt Ritchie gives a lot more than than John Joe Shelby ever does. But you know, I, I tend not to criticise him too much. I'm just not a big fan of his. You know, that's all. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but then looking as well, like you know, with the end of the season just on the horizon as well, other than the ownership. Of Newcastle, what what sort of players do you think, or like what positions do you reckon you you know Newcastle United would have to strengthen in order to, to put in a season next year that supporters would be proud of? We need we need we need we need investment. Do we need serious investment? No, we just need sensible investment. Um, you know, we need a goal scorer or two. Um, it's, you know, it's it's credible the way that they've got the team playing at the moment. Um, you know, we've got a strong defence, like you just pointed out, but we do need somebody to score goals, um, and it needs to be somebody who's prolific, 
and who's used to the Premier League, not somebody who has to come in and try and find a feet like Joe Linton. So, you know, from my point of view, that's, that's the key area. Um, we still probably need to strengthen, I would say, midfield. You know, we need a creative. We need we need a creative player. I mean, you know, you, you obviously favour John Joe Shelby and think you can do that, but he's, you know, maybe he's, now that he's been offered a new contract, they're going to stick with him. But I think for me, you need somebody a little bit younger, you know. I mean, you look at the, some of the young players that are coming about, um, you know, like like the two long stuff, there's maybe it's time to give them a bit more encouragement and, you know, set the team around them as opposed to putting it around like an old head. But, you know, look, it's... It's not a massive job. Um, Steve Bruce has proved that, hasn't he, this year? That, you know, we've got the 35 points you know, quite comfortably. Um, and you know, we've had a good cup run, so we won't need to spend a fortune. And, and only you might actually, well, as long as he's the owner, we'll never spend a fortune at the club. Just one thing we like to do with all the guests on the Premier League nightclub is that we like to go and ask them what their ideal five-a-side team is from the current sort of right. crop of players that are playing. So with that in mind, from the, current team. from the current sort of crop of Premier League players that are going around any, right any, now, any club, any club, yeah, any club, who who any would club. who would I'm make your okay. five a side team, and in what sort of order would you have them? Yeah, there has to be a goalkeeper. There has though, to be right? a goalkeeper. Dubravko's going to be in goal. Yes, you just need to look at his stats. Fair enough, he's made a few errors. Probably, I think, I think it's, I think he's up there in the in the top two for most most errors. However. He's, he's also up there for the most shots saved. So, going to have the Brad Curran go. Um, I'll, I'll go back to up front then. Um, uh, I think I think for a centre forward, I would go for Pedro. Fair enough. Chelsea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think he would bring a lot to the team. Um, the rest of the team, I would definitely go over. I would definitely go over St. Maxim. I'm going to have to have any Castle or another any Castle player because yep. <laughs> you know, he terrorises people. And again, in the 11 or 5 game, you know, he's like a headless chip at the time. <laughs> on a five side course, on a five side court, I think it'd be a lot different. Um, so I think, I think two, two more to go. Two more to go. I would probably go for um, Mount at Chelsea. Yep. I think he would. I think he would bring a bit to the team as well. And I think you've um, just got a defender one, left. One more player, defender left. Yeah, I think. Jane, I'm not going to look past. I'm not going to look past Newcastle. I'm going to go for Kieran Clark. Kieran Clark will give us. Kieran Clark will give us. He might get sent off, but he, he's not. You know, he's a good player. Technically, he's a good player. He could play anywhere. And, and Kieran Clark is probably one of my favourites. So that's be side the same team. Lad. Newcastle dominate them as you'd expect, but. <laughs> <laughs> So it was Dubravka, Kieran Clark. <laughs> so just to recap, sorry, it was it was um, Dubravka in goal, Kieran Clark, Alan Saint Maximan, um, Mason Mount, and Tammy Abraham. Oh, Pedro. Sorry, Pedro. Pardon me. Um, yeah, and just quickly to wrap up as well, I think um, something that a lot of uh, I guess supporters overseas. And in England as well, probably wouldn't know about Australian fans is that we watch the EPL at like three thirty in the morning consistently every week, and yeah. I think something as an Australian supporter that we like to sort of get feedback on is that if you had to watch a game at three thirty in the morning, say Newcastle played out in Singapore or, or somewhere in Asia or somewhere like that or the Middle East, would you be willing to get up at three thirty a.m. for a game? hundred percent. I mean, it, yes. you know, I think most most Jordans you'd find are probably still out at that time anyway. So it's <laughs> much of a chore for us. Just walking straight you know, out of the curry house. It, go, <laughs> it, it, would, it wouldn't go down too well with a with a missus, but you know that's, that's probably what you'd do. Fair enough. All right. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for coming on. It's always a pleasure to get a uh, perspective of those who do live in England because, you know, we always try to get in touch with the game as best we can, but obviously our knowledge at times can be limited to uh, compared to those who live in the country. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, we'd obviously... No, it's a pleasure. As I speak, as I speak the, the train is just pulling into Newcastle and I'm just seeing the time bridge. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, we'd love to have you on again, maybe later on in the season or or next season, and hopefully the the state of Newcastle Football Club is uh, in a better position than it is right now. No, I'd love to, lads. Well, listen, good luck with the show. Speak this soon. Thank you Thanks, so much. Steve. Well, how about that, lads? Another uh, prime special guest fr- from the Premier League nightclub, mate. I reckon from there we'll ask Steve if he's because he's such good mates with Rafa. 
We'll get Raffa on. on. <laughs> Maybe add him to our WhatsApp group message <laughs> and we'll get Raffa's thoughts on the pod. <laughs> Maybe he can coach us like he did with Newcastle. That would be insane. That would be insane, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it, it, well, he clearly knows a lot of people at Newcastle, so who knows? Maybe that's an avenue we should um, pursue. Yeah, anyway, for sure. Alan Shearer. Th- that interview is good, but what's about to come up is even better. Is it time again? It is time for the famous Damo's Dollars. I think we should end the episode here. What do you reckon, Woody? Third week in a row. Oh, let's end it. Let Damo. me have it. It is time for Damo's Dollars. Show me the money. <laughs> All right, lads, this this one is going to come off. It's a guarantee. Okay, I've, I, I I like my own thinking in this one. First up, Arsenal v Brighton, two dollars fifty five for a draw. This one is good. Okay, the reverse fixture was probably the lowest point of the season for Arsenal. A two one loss at home. Arsenal having a away- this is interesting. Arsenal having a away trip to Manchester City on Wednesday night, then have a trip to Brighton on the weekend. That's literally south of England, up to the north. It's a tough, tough away trip, and obviously they're going to go via London back to their home. home. It's, can, it's, can just you, hear me you, out. Can, can you, you just you? hurry up, mate? Get to the point. Hear me out, okay? <laughs> Arsenal have won two away games all season. This is going to be real tough for them. Brighton have lost actually just four home games all season, even though they're not they're not a very good side. They're not that bad at home. So I have draw written all over this one. Are you telling me you're picking this game? You're picking, you're picking an Arsenal draw because they have to take the train... Across the Move country. on. I'm right. telling you. On to I'm the next you. one, Damon. On to the next one because right. we all know it's going to lose. All right. Newcastle versus Sheffield. Another draw. $3.10. We've just spoken about Newcastle. And you just spoke to Steve Wraith and you're betting against Newcastle to win. To be honest, I think it'd take a draw against Sheffield. But last time these two played, Newcastle stunned the Blades 2-0. Remember, Shelby scored when everyone thought it was offside and Henderson stopped. That was a yeah. big moment in the season. Um, it's a really tough matchup, this Newcastle, just three home losses and Sheffield only two away losses all season. So both teams really suiting their statistical evidence in this one. So it's hard to see either team getting a result. So I'm going draw here as well. Next up, Chelsea have a trip to Villa and they're going to win this at $1.62. I really like it. Villa's confidence is on the floor after a terrible display against Leicester. Chelsea had their first really good performance for, for some time last week against Everton, a big 4-0 win. They're flying. Their Champions League tie isn't this week, which means they get a full week off. They're not going to rest any players because they're out of the tie with Bayern anyway. I can't see Chelsea not winning this one. Next up, Liverpool, a win versus Everton. Now, I heard some chat on another particular podcast, which I won't mention, yeah, yeah. saying that Everton are going to get up for this one to stop Liverpool just walking into a tie to win. Well, anyone who thinks that Liverpool are going to let Everton stop them are kidding themselves. Liverpool, at the moment, clearly are a bit shaky. They, they know they're going to win it. It's almost impossible for them not to. But they, they need to shift their attention onto something else in order to win the game. Perfect opportunity here. For the first time, they're up against a team that they really have history against. You look at their past games, West Ham, Norwich, Watford, and who did they play on the way? And Bournemouth. Like, those teams are down the bottom. There's not much history there. It's hard to get up and about when you're worrying about a league title. Everton, yeah, yeah, yeah. switch the attention to Everton. We've got to beat Everton. Not, don't worry about anything else. And that's why they're going to get the win. So that's my pure emotional tip of the week. So altogether, 1950. So if you put 10 bucks on, you are guaranteed to get $195 back. Do you just like it, boys? Just a reminder, 18 plus, please gamble responsibly. And Damo, just a reminder as well, yeah, your odds have been cut Essentially in half because you've gone for some safer options. I think here. Yeah, I think I, I, love the I think that like, says no, something about your confidence. How's as well. his emotion? My emotional tip is Liverpool to win. No, well, I just feel Woody was nodding his head in yeah. agreement whilst I was explaining that. Do you? So can yeah, I just get you some said credit? It was an emotional tip. It, it is. It is an emotional game for Liverpool. Okay, whatever. It's all right. I'm, uh, that's it. That's all I've got. So just put ten bucks on it and. Come back to me with $195 next week, boys. Is that exactly what you said last few weeks? Yeah, but you know, sometimes shit happens and right. and it doesn't doesn't come off. <laughs> One leg out a quarter a quarter of success in the last two weeks. All right. right. Well, so You've won ra- two legs out of eight in the last two weeks. Two yeah. legs. Mate, it's gonna be four out of four this week, I promise. Anyway, boys. To wrap up, Damon, where can they find us? They can well I, no, I don't I don't say that. Woody, <laughs> where do, where do they find us if they want to find us on Instagram? At Premier League Nightclub on the gram and Damo. Wait. On yeah, you, you could have asked Sam, but I'll go with it. At uh, at PL Nightclub on the Twitter. And Sam, can they just search us on Facebook? 
Yes. Yeah, they can. can. Yeah, nice. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's and, pretty much it. And no, I, nothing else is I coming. Actually, Don't no, give me this. I actually, I did my first TikTok yesterday. Oh, no. Oh, you know what? No, you're not getting any airtime for that. <laughs> We're wrapping it up. I'm done. Woody? Thank you very much, everyone, for having a boogie in the nightclub. And thank you, Steve Wraith, as well, for your appearance. Catch us next week, next week guys, as per usual. Hope you have a nice week. See you later. See ya.